Martin along today to... Uh, um, Carol, if I may just ask to stop broadcast, please. Brief Sorry. What was that, Liz? Sorry, if I could just ask that the broadcast be started, please, uh, uh, Bethany. Oh, sorry. Are you ready? I believe we're, me. We're ready. Okay. Okay, so welcome, everybody. Um, do we have any apologies for absence? Uh, not that I'm aware of, Gant, so I believe we okay. have... Uh, okay. Yeah, actually, I must say to you all, um, this meeting is being recorded. Uh, even though it's, a, I keep calling it a meeting, it's actually a briefing. Lisa's has tried to drum that into me, but I'm still saying meeting. So it's a briefing. However, it is still being recorded, so it will be used in the public domain. Um, it has been raised. There are no uh, declarations of interest on this agenda. However, apparently they are not needed. But in my view, it is being recorded, this meeting. If you do have any declarations of interest and you feel more comfortable to declare those, then please do. When we get... So, uh, would you like... Would anybody like to record that now? Yes, Councillor please. Adam? King, Adam King, sorry. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Um, the one thing I should, uh, I think, given... Um, Agenda, the, the agenda item three, I, I should make um, clear, is that we are adopters, um, and so we've adopted twice. Uh, we have a son who we brought home when he was almost four um, and is now 15, and a daughter that we brought home when she was 18 months old and she's now 10. Um, but also, uh, I am the adoption panel chair with another hat on for Aspire Adoption, which is the regional adoption agency for Dorset and Bournemouth, Christchurch and Poole, and I also sit on their strategic board. So kind of adoption is my other thing that I do and I thought I should make, make that clear before um, yes. uh, Rachel uh, talked about it so yes that that's good thank, thank you, you so much that that will be noted um, okay right oh hi Councillor Henderson nice to see you uh, so I made that clear we are being recorded uh, the um, declarations of interest so I think now we can move on to minutes of the previous meeting. These are just to be noted. Um, there will be another formal, um, formally approved at a future meeting. So I'm all happy to note those minutes. Thank you. Okay, so I think I'll hand over to um, Stuart now, Stuart Ashley, the officer, because uh, we're on item three, which is the Dock South Quarterly Report, and Stuart's going to introduce that. Yes, thank you, Chairman, and good afternoon, members, um, uh, particularly new members to the Children of Families Advisory Panel. For those that don't know me, my name's Stuart Ashley. I'm the Deputy Director for Children's Services, uh, and specifically my responsibilities are for the Children of Families branch. Ostensibly, the Children and Families Branch is what you might think of as children's social care, but it's broader than that. It covers youth, youth offending and various other services as well. And over the course of the next few years, uh, all, all of the items that come to this advisory panel come from my, my service. So uh, I, I hope you'll find each of the, the papers and presentations interesting. Um, and the first the first report is, um, and I didn't realise we had an expert counsellor on, on the uh, on, on the panel, um, which is really uh, helpful to have. But the first the first report that Rachel Reynolds, who's head of the Regional Adoption Agency, is going to talk to is about the work of the Regional Adoption Agency over the last year. It is quite technical in, in places, the report, and Rachel will rightly be succinct in how she presents it, and she's very, she'll pick out the, the key highlights. Um, I would say, as the Deputy Director, um, we can take great pride in this report. It is... Um, a really strong regional adoption agency that we have across Hampshire, and it is across Hampshire. It's a pan Hampshire adoption agency. It covers South Hampshire, Portsmouth, and the Isle of Wight. It is uh, led by Hampshire, um, and, and so Rachel reports to me. So that's the sort of context of the report, and I'll hand over now to Rachel if I can. Thank, Thank you. Um, uh, before Rachel starts the report, can I ask you all if you have any questions? Because you ask them at the end of the presentation rather than jumping in. Uh, so that would be brilliant. Thank you very much. Sorry, Rachel. Thanks very much. Thanks, Councillor. Well, thank you firstly for inviting me. It's lovely to meet you all and be here. 
Um, I guess just Stuart has very rightly um, just outlined a little bit about our partnership. Um, I'm, I'm Rachel and I'm the head of Adopt South. Um, we've been launched now two years, so since April 2019. So we're a bit of a baby councillor um, in compared to Aspire because Aspire, I believe, were one of the first ones that set up. Um, so we launched in 2019. I was actually the head of adoption in Hampshire before that. Um, and so it's been a very, um, really enjoyable and interesting experience bringing together those four local authorities of Hampshire and the Isle of Wight and Portsmouth and Southampton. And, um, and the government asked local authorities to do this. Um, uh, they asked local authorities to join together for efficiencies and to see if we could actually make some economies of scale, but also to increase our pool of adopters um, by joining together to, to reduce that competition and to um, join together on adoption support so that adopters across any region could have that same offer. And, um, and I will say, you know, it really has been, um, been a joy to lead, but it's been very successful in those outcomes that we set out to achieve has really, have really come to fruition. So if you don't mind, I thought I'll just get my report up and I'll just go through those highlights with you. So just a few like few highlights here. It's since we started in April 2019, um, we have found families for 298 children. 106 of those have been what we call hard to place. And what we mean by that is children that wait the longest. Um, so that might be sibling groups. It could be children um, who are slightly older. And by adoption terms, we mean by that children over the age of four or five. So not particularly old. Um, children perhaps with additional needs and, uh, and disabilities. And children who come from black and ethnic and minority groups. Out of those 298, we have formally linked at panel. Um, so I'm interested in the councillor who obviously um, chairs that panel. So 226 would have formally been linked at panel. And, um, and the other side of panel is approving new adopters as well. And, um, and, and over those two years, we've approved 238 new adoptive families. And so 117 in our, year, in our second year and 121 in our first year. And, um, and that's really made a big difference actually to how quickly we can find families for our children. We started off Adopt South when the four local authorities came together with just 24 adopters that didn't have any links. And we ended our year two with, with around 60, offering obviously real choice for our children um, that, come, that come forward needing that family. We've also got an adoption support service um, and we've been able to use that as a regional service across, the, across all four local authorities. And um, in over the two years, we've had near enough 4,000 inquiries for support. So that's been quite vast. I think what's been quite interesting is that the first year saw just 650 and the rest have been in our second year. And I think the reason for that is twofold, really. One is that um, I think COVID has had a big impact on, on families and, um, and, and adoptive families needing that extra support. But also, I think we've become a bit known now as a regional adoption agency. And thankfully, adopters know, I'm, I'm hoping, what support is out there. And they've been knocking on our door, rightly so, asking for that support. Um, the government give us um, timescales. We're, we're very timescaled in adoption, um, very data-based, um, and the government give us timescales for the first part of assessment, um, which is when we gather all the checks and references on new adopters and we start preparing them, and we have two months to, to do that piece of work, and um, well, we've managed to reduce those timescales and we've been under the government threshold. And in the, the second part of the assessment, when we meet people face-to-face -face and we really get to know them and understand them, um, we have four months to do that and we, again we've been able to achieve under um, the, the government time, for, time scale for that really reducing that adopter journey for adopters that have come forward the other part that um, adoption is time scaled on is is the number of days that children come into care and um, and we find that that permanent family for them in one of the school cards so what we call school card one and that starts at the points of children coming into care and we have 426 days to, to meet the, the government threshold. And I'm really pleased to say that all four local authorities in both of our years have actually been under, and, under that threshold. And I guess another highlight I wanted to draw out was um, our, our disruption rate. Very sadly, sometimes um, you know, adopters have that adoption order and they, and they, they go off and be their family, um, but things might not always go as well as they hoped for afterwards. 
and um, and we've um, in the national um, average for that is about a 3.2 percent um, disruption rate, and um, and in across our region last year we were 0.6 percent, so a real decrease um, than the national average. So obviously good news for our families and the fact that children have stayed together and we've been able to support them and not and not for them not to break down. But also, I guess, from a financial point of view, um, you know, if we had met the, if we had um, been the same as the national average, we worked out that would have been about 32 children that come back into our care system at a cost of, of, of two or three million. Um, so, you know, uh, two aspects there, I guess, about obviously wanting to make sure that that remains permanent for the children, but also, of course, it has a financial aspect too. And our, and, our, and our adoption support in the second year, and I apologise, that's a, a, a typo, it should be 2020 to 2021. In our second year, 554 children and young people access an adoption support plan from our adoption support service. I'm just going to quickly flick through some bits, but we can always come back to it, of course. So over our two years, um, we have um, linked 226 children and of those, 113 have been Hampshire, 19 the island, um, 40 Portsmouth and 54 Southampton. And so I guess that just gives you an idea really about, uh, obviously Hampshire are very much the largest um, agency, uh, the, the, the largest local authority. And what's um, interesting as well is that there's been some, um, uh, the DfE have published um, some data. Um, this particular period was from October 2019 to, to September 2020. And there are now 31 regional adoption agencies. Either all local authorities are now joining or have joined um, a regional adoption agency. And out of those, um, we approved in that time period, we approved the most adopters and also have the lowest number of children waiting. So that was really good news for us. I thought I'd just quickly go through our strengths in our last two years, if that's OK, and our, and our vulnerabilities. Certainly what I think has been a real strength in our in our um, two years has been our recruitment and those adopters that have come forward. And so again, the published data showed um, that nationally there was a 13% reduction in, in, um, in adopters coming forward. We were very fortunate to buck that trend. And um, it, when we were the four local authorities pre-Adopt South, we had a total of 92 adoptive families. But in our first year, we managed to recruit and approve 121 new adoptive families and in our second year, 117. And so that's given a real, um, a real choice really for our children's social workers in finding that right match for our children. COVID of course has had an impact as I'm sure you, you would imagine. Um, although interestingly, not on recruitment, we've actually found that our recruitment has, um, ha has, uh, has, you know, has been very successful and uh, more people have come forward. I think the reason for that is that they've really taken time to reflect perhaps on their lifestyle and what they want to do. We've had to adapt to that. And normally over the summer period, for example, we'd be off to all the shows, we'd be at the new forest show this month, for example, or next month. And of course, all those have now we're into our second year of them being canceled. And so we've had to do very different things. And one, one thing we've done is to, uh, is to have some speak to an adopted sessions. And we've had um, a, a, a fair few adopters come forward to really help us with this and, um, and to speak to prospective adopters coming through which has been really successful in helping people decide actually to go forward for adoption. And um, I talked a little bit just now about those improvement in timescales and, um, and over, um, over our first year, we averaged 1.7 months, so well under our two, our two months for stage one. And last year we averaged 1.5 months. And um, the, the, the average before that over the four local authorities was, uh, was over the, the government time scale of 2.1 months. So that's been a real, real success for us. And stage two, um, we're giving those four months and we've averaged 3.8 months over those, both of those um, years, which has been good news. I've talked a little bit as well about the number of families that we've been able to find um, placements for uh, and families for. Um, and I guess just to highlight, when we launched in, um, in April 2019, we had 39 children who didn't have any potential links for a family. We ended our year one with, with 12 and we ended our year two with just two children. So that was really good news and the families by coming together and, and really bringing the expertise and that knowledge together that we've managed to find families for, for those children. 
I think another strength has been that we've been we've had a dedicated stage one team. So a group of social workers um, who have really um, driven stage one and made that a timely process for adopters coming through, chase those checks and references, which sometimes can seem to take forever coming back, but also to start preparing adopters for the task ahead of them. And so we've um, we've thought of different ways of how we can do that. And that's included buying virtual reality. And I don't know where any of you have ever tried it, um, but it's really quite powerful actually to have a have a to really experience what it's like for a child, for example, to have trauma or domestic violence in the womb and what that's like for a child and the impact that that can have afterwards. And um, and we've also had a mentoring scheme and we've had, a, I believe it's 35 adopters that have come forward to support our family. So right from the very beginning, we'll give um, a, a doctor, prospective adopters and adopter mentor um, to, um, to support them. We've really tried to focus as well on our training pathway. And so rather than just have um, stage one and stage two training, we've, um, we've looked at different ways. And so we'll make sure that everyone is first aid trained have a care of infants course, which is really just a basic um, care of, of children under the age of five, and also concentrate on having a, a therapeutic parenting course called Adopting Changes, which we've invested in for all of our social workers to be trained um, so that when a child is placed, we can, we can give them some therapeutic techniques for adopters to really help them um, you know, on their adoption journey. I've talked a little bit about mentoring support and the mentors that we have and 186 um, families at the end of our year two were receiving that support. Talked a little bit about our speed guest school cards as well. So we've seen a real reduction in, um, in the, you know, the number of days that children have um, from coming into care to being with their adoptive family. And again, the comparison data tells us that we were just what we were one of just eight REAs who had that school card one under the threshold. Now, I know at the beginning I talked a little bit about the, the number of disruptions post order after the adoption order has happened, but also sometimes, sadly, perhaps placements break down um, when, um, you know, soon after perhaps they happen and before it goes to court and they become that adopter's child, when perhaps the match isn't quite right or adopters, it's very different for adopters than perhaps they thought it would be. And again, we were, we're very pleased that we've had a really low self, a low disruption rate with just two disruptions in our second year out of those 108 placed and three in year one when we, we placed 118. We've also seen real advantages of more local placements. Um, the four local authorities before, not quite so much Hampshire, um, but certainly the other local authorities were placing a lot of children externally and a long way away. And of course, that means an impact on staff time and um, in contact with their foster carers, with those children. And so we've seen some real advantages really of, of being able to place our children much more locally. We've also seen those real advantages of joining together that regional adoption support and um, and having a much bigger offer than perhaps what some local authorities were used to. And there's been advantages for Hampshire too. Um, you know, certainly some of the other local authorities were offering support that we weren't, that Hampshire weren't. And by joining together has been, you know, a, a real, um, been able to offer, ha have a real consistent offer for all adopters coming forward. Talked a little bit as well about those huge number of inquiries that we've had in our year two, and it'll be quite interesting what happens, um, you know, as we hopefully come out out of out of lockdown. The government give us um, a pot of money called the Adoption Support Fund um, for therapy, and um, and we've joined together as as a region for that too, and also gave us um, a, a, some extra money actually for the co for COVID nineteen and supporting families through that time. And, um, and during um, our second year, we were able to claim half a million, which was extremely beneficial and made a lot of difference to families. And just a little bit about our low interagency spend as well. Um, we in, in our year two, we we purchased um, and I know that doesn't sound a very nice word actually to say we buy adopters, but when we can't find adopters in house, um, then we look nationally, um, perhaps for adopters that might be the right match. And out of those 108 in our second year, um, we, we purchased um, four um, adopters um, nationally, which is very low in three in our first year. And I guess just to compare that, um, we, there's been a bit of a survey with the other REAs and the average um, other REA um, purchased 33% of, of what um, of, their, of their placements externally. If we had done that, um, it would have meant around um, 32 children um, being placed 
um, which we worked out would be it would have been about a million pounds, so a huge cost to that, as well as the fact as actually having those children having children placed locally and the advantages that that brings. We have had an evaluation of REAs and the DOV have been out to visit us and they really um, highlighted our virtual reality and our preparation of adopters, which was good. And also our, uh, we've got a partnership with the Hampshire Football Association, which also goes over and the other, uh, the other local authorities as well. And that's been, that you know, they will use their Facebook and, and they'll tweet us. And um, we have a Drop South Cup, cup um, that's given out at football matches and that's really highlighted. And people have come forward on the back of that inquiring about adoption. And just finally, I thought I would oops, I'd just share with you, um, the, you know, the comparisons with the other REAs based on what the DfE are, are, are published. And out of those 31, as I said just now, and we were one of just eight who had school card one under government thresholds, we have the lowest number of children waiting. We approved more adopters than any other REA. Our adopters spent less time um, from inquiry on their adoption journey, both from inquiry to stage one and, in, and also um, we were the only REA who averaged stage one and two in timescales. And we also placed um, more than 100 children. We were one of just four who did that. And we placed the lowest externally as well. And, um, and I've just put a little bit about our challenges there, which has been very much about COVID. And, um, and, but we, you know, we, we adapted quickly um, and we, we believe we've still given people a good service. Although, of course, we've had to do a lot virtually and quickly get our workshops and our training, etc., online. Rachel, Rachel thanks. Thank, thank you so thank much. You. You're welcome. I've got feedback. Sorry. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Yes. Uh, okay. Good. That was really informative and, uh, and really, really um, uh, amazing to hear all that. Uh, so, thank you for that. I have Anne, Anne Briggs, Councillor Briggs, would you like to uh, ask a question? Yes, please. Thank you, Chairman. Um, Rachel, a really good report. Um, it's so good to hear so many of our children are finding homes and it's all working out well for them. But what happens to the very few that have disruption? I've got two questions, please. Firstly, what happens to the children? because um, they must need a lot of counselling after that's happened. Do they go back into foster care? And are the people who wanted to adopt allowed to try again with a different child? Thank you. Quite happy to. Uh, absolutely. I mean, the first part of your question, Councillor, um, about you know, what happens to them, um, I guess it very much depends on their circumstances and what age it breaks down. If it's pre-order, so those two or three that I talked to you about that, that didn't work out pre-order, then um, we would go, we would look for another family. There have been a couple of occasions when that hasn't been right, and they might have been older children that you know, perhaps we felt that actually their bond with their, their birth parents was very strong, and it might have meant that whatever family, that to actually try another family would not be the right thing, not as an adoptive family. And so we would have gone back to court to change the plan for another or, or, or permanency plan, perhaps long-term fostering, so that they can keep those ties with their birth family. Because adoption, I guess, is very final in some ways, isn't it? You know, though contact may still happen with parents, and certainly there are still, you know, there are there's the, the letterbox contact, which you may have heard about, that um, children can keep in touch. And also there are some occasions when they might have face-to-face -face um, contact with their families, but not very often. And I think sometimes with older children, with a different type of permanency plan, with long-term fostering, it allows them perhaps to, um, you know, to still be loved and in a permanent family, but may not have that, that bit with adoption that they're not quite ready or, or it may not never be ready to quite commit to. If it, they're older and, and, and um, you know, perhaps sometimes that it breaks down after adoption order in their teenage years, certainly adoption on after order it's more likely to break down, I think, when they are significantly older. And, um, and then, of course, that's extremely sad for the children and for the family as well. And, um, and they, it might be foster care or it may be residential care. And, um, and I guess by that, you know, their needs could be quite great by that time. Thank you. And the would-be adopters, do they yes. have the chance? Absolutely. And so what would happen is we would um, we would redo that assessment, not all, not not all in total, but we would do an update and we'd talk to them, we'd give them some time to, to reflect and we would pay for them to have some counselling if that's what um, was needed. We would absolutely recognise that it's terribly traumatic 
for them as well as the children because no one comes into adoption you know feeling that this would happen and um and so we would we would do an update of their assessment talk to them about what was right and um and uh, and go back to our panel um to either approve them i mean there may be the odd occasion when we feel that's not right and um and obviously that's for a panel and an agency decision making to decide as well but we'll certainly give them the opportunity and to reassess them for that Thank you very much. And sorry to have asked the, those questions after a very, very positive report. Thank you. Um, uh, we have a couple of hands up here. Councillor Wade. Uh, thank you, Chairman. And it, Rachel, that, it really is a very positive report, and that's it's really good to see all that hard work uh, going to, 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 to make things better. Um, the question I want to ask, really, we've, we're coming out of an awful period post-pandemic and the implications of very many uh, problems from that are only just starting to, to, to come 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 to life now um i, I notice you you've had a, a sort of a, as you started an improving curve which which is really good to see the question is i don't know where you can answer this on what Pat stewart might have chip in are we about to see a, a, a big increase in children needing adoption as a result of some of the, the byproducts of the, the, of the pandemic and the effect it's had on the dynamics of families. Do you see you are able, no, no, I'm not able to cope is the wrong word. Do you see you will be able to, 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 to deal with that? And do we have any idea, and this is really strange, perhaps a how long is a piece of string question, how, any idea how big that potential uh, iceberg might be? Because I remember talking to, 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 to Stuart and, um, and Steve Cropper before, saying that whereas we come out of lockdown, demand rises in children's services, uh, and, and clearly we're, we're coming out of lockdown and possibly more things, more issues may arise and more children need, need, need caring for in, in this measure. I just wonder if you've got some sort of comment on, on that, please. I mean, I guess, I'm oh, sorry, Stuart, carry on. No, no, go, go ahead, Rachel, then I'll perhaps give the wider context across. Yeah, um, I guess certainly from, obviously, from my, with my adoption hat on, um, you know, the number of children coming through is always very much linked with children coming into care. And so if the number of children coming into care rise, then obviously our numbers will arise, will, 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 you know, will rise it, it, it with that. We've actually had a bit of a dip, which is quite interesting, actually. So certainly in our year one, we had slightly less placement orders coming through, and that's a national picture as well. And, um, and year, in our year two, it started to go up slightly, but we're still not at the levels actually, which is interesting, um, which was pre-Adopt South. And that's a national picture of how many children are coming through to adoption. Some of that is, although our, our numbers do uh, do relate to, um, to children coming into care, of course, there are other alternatives to adoption, and it may be that they remain with their foster carers. We have um, family members come forward and they may take out special guardianship orders, which are also on the rise. So sometimes when, it, when special guardianship orders go up, then adoption may actually go down a little bit because obviously there's just different um, you know, ways of permanency. Um, your question as to whether we can cope, yes, I, I mean, from an adoption point of view, because numbers are slightly lower, I and we've been very successful with recruitment, I do think we will be able to find families for those children. And, um, and I don't feel particularly, um, of course, we're always concerned with more children coming into care. But I do think whilst there, of course, will be pressures on Adopt South, I, I believe, you know, with everyone's support, we will, you know, we will ride that one out and we will manage and we'll do everything we can to find the right families for those children. Thank I you. think we want to ask it from a, from a more of a local authority point of view, Stuart. Mm. Yeah, so uh, it's a really good question, Councillor Wade. In terms of demand, um, as I've said to members previously, since the beginning of lockdown one, back at the end of March last year, we've seen a, well, actually it was April by the time it came through, it been about 15% above normal demand. January of this year, that started to go up to 20% above normal, and the last eight weeks has been about 40% above normal. Now, we've received additional corporate support we've got additional resource across the service so we are able to absorb that extra work at the front door and then as it goes through into the social work teams what we've also seen is a rise in complexity but interestingly enough because of the way that we've redesigned the service over the last few years we haven't seen a rise in the number of applications to court and it's through that route that children would end up being adopted through care proceedings 
so we have a we do have a you said an iceberg i'd say yes the iceberg has parked itself in our multi-agency safeguarding hub temporarily i hope um we we uh, but i'm not anticipating that the same volume proportionately will go on to be adopted because i think we have some good services in place um to ensure that the children and families receive the right support at the right time but we are exceptionally busy at this current moment thank you thank you um we have three more speakers councillor henderson thank you chair rachel thank you so much for such a, an, an encouraging presentation um, that was wonderful. Thank you. Um, my, my question is about um, older children um, going in, um, in, into adoption. And is there ever a problem in Hampshire where we try and place children within the community that they're, they're recognised or traced by birth parents? Because I know that that can be a problem. Yeah, yes, it can. Um, and I think the answer to that, Katza, is that we, we, we are very careful where we match. And I think actually being a bigger region has been very helpful <laughs> because, of course, if children are placed at the bottom of Hampshire, we can we can look at families at the top um, or, you know, we can place them on the Isle of Wight now or we can really use our region to the best um, of our ability to make sure, you know, that 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 people uh, if, if we were worried and that certainly yeah. you know, very much part of our matching. We also, of course, recruit from outside our border. So, you know, if people come from, you know, 10, 20 miles outside, we wouldn't necessarily say no to them. We would, um, you know, if they, particularly if they were able to, if they were, they, they had lots of skills and experience or could take siblings, we would absolutely, you know, want to assess them because, you know, sometimes perhaps adopters that live slightly further afield can be really helpful for us. Mm. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mm. Um, well, I'm sorry, Councillor Adams King, please. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Um, Rachel, I, uh, as you can probably imagine, I could talk to you for ages. <laughs> yeah. <but> I won't. <laughs> um, I just, just say this is brilliant. Um, you know, a fantastic report and fantastic outcomes as well. Um, I'm, ex I'm extremely jealous of your ADN figures. Um, <laughs> I think they, they, they are the, the third one is. Uh, a benefit that's the just the time taken between a panel of, of saying recommending yes and the agency decision maker doing the decision which is only a couple of days which elsewhere is taking anything oh, well over a week to 10 days so so they, they're great um I, i've got a couple of quick questions though if you wouldn't mind um I, I think your your experience is similar to mine in the sense that the number of adopters have gone up in the last year um We've been seeing many more approvals come through in Dorset as well. Um, I was wondering, though, have you seen what, what's the picture been like in terms of LGBT adopters? Because we've seen a big uptick and I didn't know whether you'd seen that as well. Yes, yes, we've seen a big increase. We've actually done that, you know, we've particularly targeted as well. Um, you know, we, we know that many have a lot, lot to, a lot to offer. And we've, um, you, know, you probably know about New Family Social, and we've, um, you know, really invested in membership. And we've also have some champions in our recruitment team. So we are very fortunate to have a dedicated recruitment team who offer, I, I, I believe, excellent customer service and when people come forward. But we have a champion who, um, we have a BAME champion, and we have a champion in LGBT+. Plus. And I think that's really helped as well. And, you know, they, um, that particular person will advise us. He's an adopter himself, and, um, and he will advise us. And, uh, and that's been a real strength, actually. And um, yeah, so we, we're really pleased and we've got a real, um, we're really working on diversity, actually. We know that we want to move away perhaps from an uh, the profile of the adopter that used to be and to really bring forward um, a real diverse um, group of adopters that can offer real richness to our children and a real choice. Mm. Great, thanks. And um, I'm sorry, I, th I did find it somewhere in the report. Now I can't find it because you call it something different to what I know it as. But early permanence. Um, oh, have you had yes. any early? You, you had got some, but I didn't yes. think you've got mass. Is that something you're beginning to do more of? Or is it? It, it is increasing. We call it fostering for adoption, but I know exactly. You, you absolutely just a different terminology. It has yeah. increased. Um, it's increased over our, our, our from our from before pre adopt and, and through to our first and second year. Um, but it's it, it absolutely increasing that. So working as well at the front door about making sure that that fostering for adoption is um is considered at the beginning from our children's teams, but also um we've seen a real rise in, in the number of our adopters being approved for fostering for adoption. And if I could just explain, fostering for adoption um, is when children come straight into the care system to actually be placed for, with an adopter um, under um, a 
under a fostering arrangement. So even though adopters come forward for permanency, they are they are prepared to actually have a child who 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 may not actually remain with them up for adoption. They may they may actually have an alternative plan. So it is very hard for that family because they want to adopt, but then they very kindly come forward to actually have a child to actually stop the child having lots of placement moves. And they might even take that child from hospital. Actually, we certainly had some, you know, some lovely um, examples of adopters who've gone to hospital to um, to save that child actually going to a foster care or perhaps being moved again um, so that they can actually have that one placement. But of course, there is a, there is some challenges for the adopters because, you know, while we obviously all want to work to getting that child back home or to a family member rather than adoption be, be, being the end outcome. And so there could be occasions we haven't actually had it in Adopt South, I have to say, but we know it could happen when a child may actually go. We've had we've had a few that we thought they might need to move from the adopters. And, um, you know, but we try to match very carefully so the adopters are strong enough perhaps to be able to cope with that for, for some who may have had an infertility journey of many years for actually that to happen could be very challenging and difficult. Um, and also, of course, you know, we, we, we from the front door, we really look at whether, um, you know, if there's any if there's a thought, you know, if, if we're worried that a child might actually not be able to stay, then it might be that fostering for adoption is not right for that particular child either. So we have to sort of look very carefully on both sides, really. Does that answer your question, Councillor? Mm. No, it does, does perfectly. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I just go back, quickly go back to your point about the ADM. I think we're the only REA and we're very fortunate that has our own agency decision maker for approvals. And so she works just two days a week for us over the five days. And it's absolutely amazing because it does mean, of course, that she um, makes the decision on that very, very quickly. So that's how we do that. <laughs> no, that no, well, no. Thank excellent. You. And um, sorry, just one more, if I may. Um, OK. Which is just it's actually probably for both of you, both you and Stuart. Um, your financial model in terms of your when you were established, I know that there was that was kind of shared across all of the RAAs as they as they built up. Mm -hmm. uh, have you have you got a model that that is sort of set for a, a period of time, or do, are you looking at it each year? Is it or is it a three year model? Or because that that's the challenge of Aspire at the moment. They're just having to renegotiate it all, and it's all a bit of a, yeah. a challenge for everybody. Yeah. Well, when we started, everyone put their adoption, um, you know, spend in, in the model and it was for two years. And, um, right. and so, in fact, it's been extended because we're about to start our third year and we are in the middle of a review at the moment to look at that. So it sounds like we're probably as a spiral then actually obviously just look, looking at whether the contributions are right. And, um, you know, so, so we're, we're at that stage when we are reviewing that. Yeah, that's, that's, that's fascinating. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm sorry to have gone on for a no, that's absolutely fine. Um, Councillor Baines. Uh, thank you, Chairman. And i uh, just like to reiterate um, how amazing the report was, uh, Rachel. It's um, incredibly insightful to, to read and to learn about the incredible work that you do. And um, just touching upon a point that Councillor Adam King just raised around LGBT, under your notable outcomes, be really interested to know a little bit more about um, where it says evolving strategies, both in recruitment and placement for greater diversity from BAME backgrounds, uh, ethnic backgrounds and LGBT backgrounds, what that actually entails and how you're sort of going about it, if that's OK. Yes, of course. Thank um, you. So, so we have champions in the recruitment team, but we are very focused on what else we can do. And, um, and so certainly one thing which we have just done, we did a couple of weeks ago and we're going to do again, is that we had a, a webinar that we advertised particularly for LGBT um, people to come forward. And that was very successful. We had, um, you know, a lot of people join us and, um, and we're going to continue to do webinars particularly um, for, um, you know, specific groups, um, you know, to, to really support them. We will also... Um, uh, use our mentors so we, we we will always make sure that a mentor is linked um so if someone comes through with with um who is lgbt we will make sure they're linked with an with an lgbt mentor and so we stay quite focused i guess on making sure that they get the support that they need as well and um so yes yeah, so really thinking about different ways forward we've done a lot of work with our panels at the moment because we realized they weren't diverse and we've reached out to those two particular communities with, with BAME and with LGBT to ask people to come forward so that they can really be part of those panels and, uh, and make sure that we're, ask, we're asking the right questions and we're really being totally inclusive in everything we do. Mm. Amazing. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Chairman. You're welcome. Mm. Thank you.
I don't see any more hands up on this particular item. So um, thank you, Rachel, very much. Thank you. And thank you very much. Mm. No, thank you so much. OK, so we move on now to item four, which is supporting families annual report. Go back to uh, Stuart on that one. Yes, thank you, Chairman uh, and members. Just to introduce this item, uh, which actually sits, as I understand it now, within Councillor Reid's portfolio. Um, uh, and I look forward to briefing you, Councillor Reid, in, in due course. Um, I, I'm going to hand over to our lead officer, uh, Alison Carver, who is sort of she's very hands on in terms of supporting families programme in Hampshire. And she's got the detail and will walk members through the report. What I would say in terms of uh, uh, the programme in Hampshire is we've got we've got a long history of quite a, 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 a uh, a purist model um, and really uh, being rigorously reviewed as to the outcomes that we are achieving with children and families. Because members will know the what was formerly known as the Troubled Families Programme is about um, uh, uh, turning families around where there are multiple and complex issues. Uh, and that's complex issues with the adults as well as, uh, uh, as with the children. Uh, just over a year ago, um, I asked for the program to be redesigned in Hampshire. We had worked um, more hand in glove with the district councils, but our performance was, uh, and I would say this, put us on the naughty step with the with MHCLG, uh, and it was clear that we needed to turn things around for ourselves in terms of the program. Um, and so we reorganized it. And I have to say, uh, as Alice and I hope we'll go on to talk about, our performance over the last 50, 60 months has been um, it's been excellent and it was it, the changes were needed. We're still working hand in glove with partners. This is a multi agency program, of course, but I think the way that we're now managing it through children's services and specifically through children's social care has led to a greater improvement in performance and more importantly, um, supporting a larger number of families to make positive changes to their lives. So on that note, I will hand over to Alison if I can, please. Thank you. Welcome, Alison. Thank you. So, yes, my name is Alison Carver. I've been part of the Supporting Families team in Hampshire since December 2016. But in May, my role was changed slightly, as Stuart's alluded to. We um, did some restructuring, really, of the programme within Hampshire. So I'm now the coordinator um, for the programme. Um, I thought I'd start with just giving you a little bit of background because I'm conscious some of you may not be as familiar with the programme. Um, so it commenced in 2012. Um, since then, there's been various phases and the programme has continued to evolve and change over that period. Um, as Stuart's mentioned, the programme is there to support families with multiple and complex needs at an early help stage through the support of a lead professional. Um, and the plan is that we work together with families and across the partnerships in order to support them in achieving positive outcomes. Um, we want to reduce the risk of them escalating in the level of need for the family. We want to build the resilience of the family um, and we want to increase the likelihood of positive outcomes for all family members. The term multiple and complex needs, just to explain that, um, is there's six key criteria that the programme covers, and it's any family who meet two of the criteria. So the overarching six areas are education, prime antisocial behaviour, children who need help, worklessness or risk of financial exclusion, domestic abuse and health, um, which really clarifies why the partnership approach to the programme is so essential to supporting families in the right way. Um, in Hampshire, we have a strong partnership in place and at a local level, one of the areas that that works particularly well is through the early help hubs and the local children's partnerships. The purpose of this report today is really to provide an overview of what's been happening in 2020 and 2021. Um, clearly, one of the key areas within the report is looking at COVID, so in um, paragraph 15, um, there's a little bit there about, you know, we recognise that the impact of COVID-19 has been significant on our families, but also for us, our staff across the partnership and the services of every um, agency has tried to adapt and develop 
um, processes to ensure that that support can continue. And throughout 2020-21, it has been possible for the partnership to carry on providing the support that families desperately needed. Um, it, in addition to this, in relation to COVID, the Ministry for Housing, Communities and Local Government did release some additional upfront funding for the programme. And one of the areas supporting families was able to support with was um, the availability of a grants round in order to enable local charity and voluntary sector organisations in a couple of different ways. It was either to convert existing working practices to enable them to comply with government lockdown guidance and or to quickly mobilise support within their community, such as food parcel delivery activity packs and all of those things that families really needed and initially at lockdown. Um, we needed those organisations with those links in the community to be able to deliver that. Um, the grants went to a range of organisations across the whole of Hampshire County Council area um, and across all areas of the programme support. So it included support for family and youth services, domestic abuse services, um, community and volunteer programmes and counselling support. And it did help to provide quite a quick turnaround for organisations to be able to deliver those services, which was fantastic to be able to help in that way um, and hopefully reduce the risk of some of the families ever needing to come through the early help um, support. Um, another key change highlighted within the report is the um, change of coordination for the programme. So for a number of years, the programme was coordinated through the local district and borough councils. And as Stuart's alluded to, we um, that we decided to bring that into children's services in 2020-21. Um, there were a number of reasons behind that. So the programme is currently on a one year funding um, once again this year and during 2020-21. So ensuring that we had the programme in a position where it would promote the sustainability um, during that uncertainty and also the need for us to be able to ensure that the outstanding services being delivered to families through the partnership was being reflected in the national outcomes data um, from the programme. So as part of that we aligned the coordination with the family support service managers taking on responsibility which ensured we kept the strong local partnership relationships um, and also ensured that across the county the services were being accessed in a consistent way for families. Um, in addition to this we expanded the team slightly so we've increased the number of children and family support workers that the programme fund so now within each district there is a children and family support worker based within the family support service team. The key priorities for them is to focus on improving the outcomes recording so that we can improve our performance nationally. Um, but also, and most importantly, it's to improve the support available to partners to take on the early, role of early help coordinator or the lead professional for the family to understand what it involves and what resources and support is available and so that they understand what information we're looking for um, in order to identify that the families have been successfully supported and have the resilience to sustain the changes that have been achieved. The feedback on these roles has been resoundingly positive and it's really helping to build relationships further within um, the local supporting families and early help arena. Um, throughout 2020-21, we've also continued to be supported through the work of our employment advisors from the Department of Work and Pensions, whose role is to work with families to, um, with the aim of getting them off of benefits and into employment. Clearly, it's been a particularly challenging year for those staff. Um, but they also support to ensure families are on the right benefits and accessing um, the benefits when they need them. Um, 
And we've also had our commissioned intensive support services who've been able to continue to provide the early help or lead professional role for some of our more complex families with higher levels of need. So that's provided by a couple of local charities, Motivate, who, for those of you who are in the Fairham Gosport and have an area may have heard of, do a lot of youth work, and also through Haven and East Hans Mind. Um, and between them, they provide intensive support spaces across the county. Moving on to the finance section of the report on page four. Um, just to explain, there's three elements of the funding for the programme in 2020-21. Um, there was an attachment figure for the number of families that we provide support for, up to a maximum number, the transformation grant, and also the reward payments that are on a payment by result, results basis. So during phase two, which ran from 2015 to 2020, Hampshire achieved 1,487 reward payments out of a permitted 5,540. So we claimed 27% of the available funding. One of the key priorities for us this year was to improve on that figure. And within 2020, 21, despite the challenges that we faced with COVID and the impact it had on families, um, we managed to achieve 76% of the available funding. So we achieved 705 of the 928 outcomes. So as you can see, that's a significant improvement. And during the course of 2021-22, um, we will be aiming to build on that and continue the work that's been achieved. Um, so onto the performance. For us, the key priority is to get it right for families. And that continues to be a priority um, moving forward. Um, to achieve this, we need to ensure, however, that we're also documenting what's happening with those families. Um, so just to explain the reward system and how the outcomes are measured, which is a key priority for um, government, we have to evidence that families have achieved a threshold against our outcomes plan, and they need to achieve the significant change and also sustain it. So it takes over a year on average to evidence a successful outcome with the families receiving a period of support and then um, achieving the sustainment period. Um, since 2018 onwards, there's been a significant effort made in relation to this area. Um, and as I've said, it's something we've continued to build on in the last year. COVID in relation to um, the performance, we had that along with the restructuring of services, so clearly it did have an impact um, on the team. It delayed the recruitment slightly for the new children and family support workers, um, and it did result in some of our families needing slightly extended periods of support. So the first two quarters were a significant challenge, and we achieved 192 successful outcomes um, reported in that period. However, the following two quarters of the year, we saw a significant turnaround with those staff embedded. And as noted in bullet 27, we achieved 513 successful outcomes um, during that second six months of the year. So it has put us in a position where we're feeling very positive for the year ahead in achieving 100% of the increased target of 967 that we have. I hope this has provided a useful overview of the programme and what's been achieved over the last year. Thank you. Thank you, Alison. That was very informative. Um, Councillor Reid, I know you said you're here as an observer. Was there anything you'd like to add or? I, I would uh, be very interested and uh, Alison won't be able to answer this just yet. Uh, in seeing whether we can cost out the benefits of the uh, families that are turned around, so costing out the pressure that they don't put uh, onto the social services and adult social care and so on. So there will be a lot of issues that um, we'll be able to pursue. But what I really joined you for, so thank you, Madam Chairman, 
is to listen to the members' comments on the report and uh, uh, pick everybody's brains. Well, thank you very much for attending this meeting. Um, I have Councillor Briggs. Thank you, Chairman. The question. Thank you. Thank you for an, another very positive report. And I think the way through this difficult time, you have got the outcomes. Um, so you you're not having to you get the extra payments is quite amazing. But could you tell me, please, how do families get on the Troubled Families Programme? How are you able to help them? Who refers them? Doctors, schools? If you could tell us, please. Yeah, so the programme now is run predominantly through our early help service. So a referral comes into children's services and the family are assessed to see at what level of support they need. Um, so any family that's assess assessed as level three, so that's the targeted early help support, um, will be heard at the early help hub with partners inputting information that they are aware of that is relevant to the family in order to develop an early help plan. Um, and at that point, they will be attached to the programme as part of that process. Sometimes we will also look if a family's come in and been assessed at level two, so they might be getting, it might be a family with a lower level of needs that doesn't quite hit the threshold for needing early help support, um, but they do have multiple needs. We're really keen to support families early as opposed to um, waiting until they meet level three before we help them. We'd rather support them before they hit that. Um, and try and prevent them needing to be heard at Harvey if at all possible. Um, and we also review some of our families who are level four, so that is children in need. So they have a social worker and they're being supported to, um, in, a, in the same way that I've described by the social worker acting as that lead professional role to review what areas of their family need support and help. Um, in order to ensure the child is able to stay safely within their household. Uh, Thank you, if, if Thank I, you I very just, much. If I could just add, Councillor Briggs, um, and this is for, perhaps for, particularly for new members to this advisory panel, um, I'm happy to offer a, a, a broader briefing on children's services or children's social care, um, because the levels two, levels three, levels four, it can be quite complicated. Uh, and there is an awful lot of, um, there's a real breadth of service within my branch. So if members of this panel would find it helpful, I'm very happy to arrange a separate briefing on, on, on the branch to, as to how it operates. If you're a member of the Children's Select Committee, you'll get that automatically because I think that's what I'm doing at the next uh, Select Committee. But if you're not and you would want a briefing for this panel, I'm very happy to, to arrange that. Thank you, Stuart. I think that'll be really helpful to members. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, um, there are no more questions for Alison, so, oh, hold on, sorry, Councillor Wade. Oh, you're up there, but you're not on my list. Yes, you are, sorry. Councillor Wade. That's all right, that's all right, Chairman, thank you. Yeah, Alison, thank you for that report. Um, just would like to explore a little bit more about the family support worker in the individual districts. Um, how does that sort of work out? And um, is the workload balanced across the district in Hampshire, or are some requiring more more work than others, I suppose, is one way of putting it. So, sorry, can I just clarify, Councillor Wade? Do you mean <clears throat> the demand levels in each district? Are they are they the same? Is... Well, that was part of the question. The other one was how does it work having the, the, the support workers? How does it work out? That's all. That's, because obviously this is this is how we have moved into this new process. Just get a better better feel feel and feel on it. Yes, uh, it's what I, I mean. You know, I, I make no bones. I, I when I uh, briefed the former lead member on the changes that were needed, I was absolutely adamant that change was needed because for five years it felt that whilst we delivered a good service, it, it just wasn't being acknowledged by government because we weren't hitting some of the key targets. And they are. It is a payment by results program so we made we made the change centralized it as in brought it into children's services but it's it's managed in each district by our early help service we put the additional resource in because we recognized that 
we needed to bring capacity to that. I don't think you can keep asking uh, the early help service to take on more responsibility and more work without giving them some additional resource. So that was that was what we did. Uh, and I'm open to looking at whether they need even more resource to continue to uh, increase our, our, our reward monies as a result of uh, successful interventions with families. So is was it's in, is iterative, I suppose, is the best answer, because that was year one. We proved uh, we're in, going into year two of the new structure and we may well tweak it again. There are different demands in different parts of, of uh, uh, Hampshire, but the early help service has absorbed that to a degree. I hope wait, that... Wait. Yeah, that sort of answer. Just wonder, is any, just out of curiosity, is any which area tends to require more support at the moment? Is that? Is it, that it's interesting. It's inter yeah, it's interesting because um, it, it very much depends on partners. Yeah. So uh, if you have a team of 10 early help workers covering, let's say Havent, for example, if I can just use Havent. Um, if, if in Havent, that team are very good at engaging with the schools to be the lead practitioner around the family or the, and with health visitors, then actually their caseloads might be slightly smaller. So when I look at my early help service, it's variable. Um, demand typically is we are busiest in Fareham and Gosport as a combined, uh, two combined districts, Basingstoke and Hart and Rushmore. That's where we see real peaks in demand. Um, and I've been in children's services long enough to see that that's moved around over the years, uh, whether that's about new builds, changing communities. Um, for example, haven't, if I go back 10 years, haven't was the real demand in my service. It ranks fourth now. It's interesting how these things change over time. But certainly the, the, the three districts I've mentioned would be where the biggest demand is. Okay. And I think New Forest comes in about fifth actually surprisingly high in terms of deprivation and demand as a result. That, that's, that's because of the isolated pockets, I would imagine. But all right, thank you, Stuart. Thank you. And thank you very much, Alison, for presenting that report. Um, we'll move on now to item five, prevent. So back to you, Stuart. Yes, thank you, uh, Chairman. I'm, Going to hand over to Sarah Marston uh, in a second, and Sarah manages our multi-agency safeguarding hub. And uh, in due course, I hope members will come and visit the multi-agency safeguarding hub. It's a combined service that we we lead with the police and with health colleagues. All work coming into children's services goes through Sarah's service at the the, the MASH, as we call it. She also has wider remit around prevent, and as we'll go on to talk about exploitation uh, as the next item. This is an important report for me because I think prevent issues, it, it, when it when it hits the headlines, it, it clearly that uh, they are significant. There's a lot of work that goes on to support children and adults to divert them away from um, extremism. Uh, uh, and let, let's be clear on that. What what I would say is, and Sarah will go on to say, last year, interesting enough, about of the referrals that were considered, uh, about 50% of those referrals involve children um, and as we as children have been in particularly an online world much more so in the last year their vulnerability around that is clearly something that we we have to be aware of so um, I, I hope members will find this an interesting and assuring report so Sarah can I hand over to you please yeah hi welcome Sarah hi thank you um, so I'll just go through some headlines of the, the report. So just to look at some context, um, every local authority has a duty under Section 26 of the 2015 Counter-Terrorism Act to put arrangements in place that will divert um, young people and adults away from um, being drawn into terrorist activities. Um, and I like to think of PREVENT as being an extension of our child protection uh, service because um, when we're talking about young people in PREVENT, we, we are actually talking about child protection cases and we're talking about young people who are vulnerable young people usually who have been groomed into, um, into this activity and have, have been ra radicalised. And it, it's very much to, to radicalise a young person is very much the same process as um, the, the 
the concerns that we have around children being um, exploited. So although some of the uh, headlines that we hear about Prevent can be quite um, alarming and quite quite sensationalist at times, I think it's always really worth remembering that when we're talking about children, we are we are generally talking about children who are vulnerable and have been groomed in, into these activities. Um, so the threat um, of international terrorism in the UK uh, remains substantial, which um, means that an attack is, a terrorist attack is, is likely. Um, throughout the last year, um, we have continued to, uh, to engage in our prevent activities along with, uh, with adult services and um, a range of multi-agency partners. Um, and our channel panel which is a monthly panel um, which which meets to discuss any young people or any adults who um, are, are vulnerable to to uh, being groomed into terrorism uh, has continued to meet throughout throughout covid we we've taken the activity um, online um, and i share that re representation at the channel panel with a team manager from from basingstoke to ensure that children's services are always represented um, because it's a, it's an all day meeting and we contribute to the discussions around children and around adults who who are presented to to that channel panel um, Nationally, the pandemic is expected to have an increase on those young people and those adults who are becoming involved uh, and engaged in, in, in the terrorist agenda. Um, and that there is a concern that, um, and Stuart alluded to it earlier, about young people being more because we've all been locked down because we haven't got our usual social activities there has been an increase in um the internet use and uh, in the same way as the the other types of exploitation that i'll talk about later uh the internet is is the kind of prime area where young people um are groomed in, into this type of activity um so nationally there's we there's been a concern about an increased interest in uh, biological or radiological um, terrorism um, and also a, a particular concern for children's services is um, the pandemic has seen a rise in the race realist movement which um, in terms of prevent terms um, there's, there's a concern that this, this movement has a, has a firm belief that um, the increased numbers of uh, BMA E people um, in, in COVID stats is, and, and COVID figures is down to biological differences rather than social economic differences. And that's, that's something that we need to keep on uh, keep a really close eye on in, in terms of children's services because we, we've been doing some work um, in children's services around uh, uh, BMA issues and um, it's just something that, that we, we just need to keep an eye on and, and be aware of. Um, as Stuart said, I manage the MASH, the Multi-Agency Safeguarding Hub, which is a uh, group of professionals. Um, so we have social workers in the MASH, we have police in the MASH, and we have uh, health colleagues in the MASH. And they're all co-located and we share information very, very quickly when we receive referrals to enable a multi-agency decision to be, be made. So all prevent referrals for Hampshire children uh, will come through the multi-agency safeguarding hub and to ensure that, that we, we do that for cases that are allocated and already have a social worker um, and the reason that we take that approach is we don't want any one single person to have um, to, to make the decision around prevent so we're really really clear that um, because it's it's such a uh, 
serious area, we're really clear that we, when we're making decisions around these issues, that we have input from our police colleagues and from uh, our health colleagues so that we can get a, a, a really full picture of what's happening for that family and, and for that, that young person. And just to strengthen that referral process, um, Counterterrorism South East have um, introduced a national referral form, which we've just adopted in Hampshire, and we're starting to embed it in our practice. Um, and that referral form, and use of that referral form, ensures that we have, um, all, that all parties have um, the absolutely correct information about about the family and it ensures that the same questions are asked and um, it ensures um, a, a consistent threshold when, when we're making referrals. When we receive a referral, um, we in children's services treat it as a child protection referral. So we treat it, we manage it under section 47 and within two hours of receiving the referral, we sit down with our police colleagues and with our health colleagues and ensure that um, all the information shared uh, between, between uh, the agencies and we make a joint decision about whether the referral meets the threshold for a child protection investigation and whether it meets the, refer uh, the criteria for a prevent investigation. Um, so that process has, has continued throughout uh, the, the pandemic. And as Stuart rightly says, we have uh, had a steady flow of referrals into uh, CRT and MASH, uh, the Children's Reception Team, the Multi-Agency Safeguarding Hub in respect of PREVENT. And if it's considered, if, if a referral is considered to be a PREVENT referral, um, so if, the, if it's considered that there's a real risk that a young person will be radicalised and drawn into terrorist activities, they go on to be considered at a channel panel. Um, and uh, that panel that it's made up, again, it's a multi-agency panel, um, and that panel will discuss a young person or an adult over a period of months until the risk has, has uh, reduced. And the channel panel is also responsible for um, ensuring that um, targeted work happens with, with the young person or with the adult in order to reduce the risk. Um, so, so that's from an operational perspective. Uh, and that's prevent from an operational perspective. Um, some of the other work that we have done in children's services is that we've worked on our training package and um, we are, we've worked with adult, adult, so sorry, we've worked with colleagues from adult services and from other areas of the council and have developed a um, online uh, training package for every member of Hampshire County Council. We're just about to roll that out to our children's services staff. Uh, prior to, to the development of this package, we were providing training through the virtual college, and then we were providing a face-to-face -face, uh, training course, which I delivered with workforce development um, for those, those staff who had direct face-to-face -face contact with um, families. Um, so we've contributed in children's services to, to that training package, and it, it is a really um, informative and good induction to the PREVENT agenda. Um, as I say, we're about to roll that out to children's services. Um, I would say that around 400 members of staff have already completed that uh, online training. Um, and we will continue to offer a face-to-face -face, uh, training course for those workers, social workers, contact workers, um, who come into close contact with uh, young people. Education. Uh, colleagues have also developed a training package for um, 
people who are, or for staff working in schools and that that's already underway and, and being ro rolled out. Um, in terms of recording, we because we because of our processes, we tend to record things in Section 47 and child, which is child protection, rather than um, as a prevent referral. So our counting of our referrals and counting of the problem tends to be manual. So we need to do a small piece of work uh, with our data team to enable our systems to readily pick up prevent rather than coming back to to the mash to 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 kind of check out our manual records and and that piece of work is in process um what we have noticed um out of the uh children that have been in, in channel and over the last year uh, 50 percent of the the people that were subject to channel panel um, were children and we have noticed that there is it feels like there is an over representation of young people who are autistic or uh, or are on the Asperger's uh, spectrum and we started to have some conversations with um, representatives uh, from from the autism board about that because that that remains a concern for us. Uh, the other thing to say is the majority of children that uh, become subject to channel tend to be um, tend to be there because uh, the concern is around right wing idealism. Um, and, and that's that, that's obviously quite quite interesting because we don't we don't always think uh, when we start to talk about terrorism, we don't tend to think about right wing uh, idealism. Um, so, so that's kind of something to, that, that we should bear in mind. Um, we do have uh, very, very clear processes in place about referrals and the system does feel very safe um, once people have, have referred on, on to us. Um, in terms of the Isle of Wight, because we, we're in partnership with the Isle of Wight and we provide a MASH service to the Isle of Wight, um, they, we manage that initial stage, that strategy discussion, and um, we manage that initial referral for the Isle of Wight, but they have their own channel panel and their own uh, channel prevent, prevent leads. Um, so, just over the last year, it, it has been busy. Um, I don't think we have seen the increases in prevent uh, concerns that, that we might have expected because of the pandemic, but we are alert to, to the fact that people have been isolated, people have been using the internet more, uh, and we're alert to, to the potential for um, an increased threat or an, an increase in, in prevent referrals. Um, there does continue to be a small number of adopted, uh, sm small number of children who are adopted into power. And, and perhaps I could just say something about uh, channel panel. When a young person is adopted into channel, uh, into channel panel, they have a whole care package. They have to be allocated to a social worker. Uh, they have a whole plan uh, around them and part of being in channel panel is they get an independent um, they get an independent worker who is a specialist in uh, this type of work to specifically work with the social worker and the young person on on reducing reducing the risk um, I think I'll probably stop there and just take some questions Thank you, Sarah, so much for that report. Uh, right, we have three hands up. So, Councillor Parker. Thank you, Chairman. Um, this is just a request, really. Um, one of the things I've noticed from some of these reports is an awful lot of um, multi-letter abbreviations that I don't doubt are very familiar to the professionals. Um, to councillors who are by definition rank amateurs and the general public who read these reports online, 
um, it would be useful to have a glossary, please. Uh, um, Julie noted, Councillor, it's a sure, well made yeah. and we'll, we'll ensure that going forward. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Irish. Thank you, Chair. I'd just like to say what a wonderful, um, informative presentation that was, and thank you very much for that. But I was just wondering, uh, with my school governor's hat on, do you do a lot of work in schools? Do you go and talk to schools or, or, or take, take up cases in schools or sort of make contact with schools, really? Um, so uh, there, there is a uh, professional called Sue Savory who has who is the prevent lead for schools and she is linked in with children's services and she's linked in with the corporate training group um, and also sits on channel panel and um, but Sue has been responsible for developing the, the training package for school staff. Um, and she, she is the link between uh, child panel and education. Um, and then when we have a young person who is presented to channel and adopted by channel, uh, the school uh, that the young person attends is always part of the planning and will always come to channel panel to give an update and to uh, take information about, about where we are in the plan. Uh, and of course, schools are often, um, schools are, are, are the, the, the people that are spending the most time with these young people. So they're often central to any prevention plan. Thank you, that's very helpful. Thank you very much. Thank you. Councillor Adams Kings. Yeah, Sarah, thank you. That, that was really helpful. Just, you may not be able to give a direct answer to this because of the confidentiality issues, but um, can you give us a sense of uh, of how many cases you're talking about with, within these different categories, how many referrals you would get to MASH each year and, and how many then go on to channel panel? Um, I'm not allowed to disclose uh, numbers and, uh, and give exact numbers, but um, if you think that, uh, if you think that um, my service, the children's reception team, which is the, the team, the contact team that sits before, um, sits before the match, we take, it will take information on around about eight or 9,000 uh, contacts uh, uh, each month. Uh, which um, we count children as a contact. It's not a very nice way of counting children, but um, uh, we probably have one, uh, less than one a month uh, in terms of uh, young people actually coming through CRT and MASH as, as, as a referral. That's helpful, thanks. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Briggs. Thank you, Chairman, and thank you, Sarah, for your report. Um, we have a lot of unaccompanied asylum-seeking children which go into foster care. Um, are foster carers given any help to what to look out for in case a child has been radicalised and what to do about it? Okay. Um, I'm also the lead for unaccompanied asylum-seeking children, and... Um, each, uh, each, as a young person comes in to uh, comes into care, we undertake a trafficking assessment and we undertake um, a, a, an assessment of that young person's needs. Um, and all young people are placed with safety plans um, because we can't rule out that they have been tra trafficked into this country for um, for specific reasons. Um, our foster carers, uh, previously we, we've given them light bite training on uh, prevent. We've now agreed that um, we are going to roll out this corporate training package to foster carers. Um, social workers are also aware of, um, of, of the prevent, prevent agenda and they're the supporting of the officers that are supporting foster carers are also aware of, of that agenda. So, um, and, and just going back to where I started, 
which is this is child protection and um, we have you know, our, our, our foster carers are, are good at spotting um, child protection concerns and, and so, so I, I think there's more work that can be done there and hopefully the training that we're going to, going to roll out will help with that but I'm, I'm confident that our carers are good at spotting uh, that those, those concerns. Thank you. Councillor Baines. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman, and thank you, Sarah, for your report. Um, again, it was really insightful. Just a couple of points from me, if I may. Um, what sort of advice is given to children at the moment, say, for example, on social media through the, the, the county comms team, if they were to be approached by someone uh, in an attempt to radicalise them? You know, what sort of um, resource or advice are they given at this moment in time to sort of, you know, give them steps to you know, shut that down as quickly as possible and report it um, to, to the right person? Um, is my first point. And my second point, you mentioned about the different ways of reporting it. I think it was an NRM form that you, you mentioned. Um, and, and obviously there is the normal sort of safeguarding um, procedure that, that can be, um, you know, uh, uh, explored as well. Um, my, my sort of question is, would something be picked up on a safeguarding referral if it related to prevent or would it have to categorically come through as a prevent referral? Um, so to deal with the second part of your question first, um, all referrals uh, that come into children's services either come in on an interagency referral form or they come in via telephone because they, they're urgent. Usually when we get prevent referrals, um, they tend to come in by telephone um, and it's at that point that we advise the uh, referrer to uh, complete the interagent uh, sorry to complete the national referral form and we signpost them to the national referral form and if necessary we'll talk them through it and walk them through it um, while they while they stay on the phone um, in terms of the second part of, oh, sorry, the first part of your question about the advice that's given to um, young people, um, I think that, that that is completed within schools and within their PHSE lessons. Um, and um, I, I think there's, there's quite a lot of work that comes out from safeguarding boards that by the education group that will target uh, giving advice to uh, to young people about safe internet use. Okay, thank you very much, Sarah. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Just to follow up, uh, those children that come into panel or obviously in, into channel are obviously aware of the concerns. They're obviously uh, you know, the worker will be having those conversations with them about safe internet use. Um, uh, when they're actually uh, subject to, to channel panel. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Councillor Way, are you coming back? Have you got another no, question? I haven't asked a question yet. Oh, so, okay. Uh, my list is flashing around here. Carry on, Councillor Wade. Oh, thank you. Uh, no, I've just, just got a, a sort of out curious question, really. Fortunately, uh, you said this is not as big a problem as it might be in other areas with numbers. When we get a case of, 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 a, of a young person that's been radicalised, do we, presumably, do you don't see if his or her friends are also radicalised or you just do that individual on its I'm just curious how this, this works because it, it's very often if, if one young person uh, uh, sadly falls to this, then they don't tend to some of their peers get involved as well. I, I just wondered if, if 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 you if you do that sort of work, uh, or do you just stick to one? Um, because we're we're doing this multi-agency and yeah. children services act acting alone. The police uh, on the counter counter terrorism uh, police will always have have an eye on that person's associates but it's very very much evidence-based and we wouldn't necessarily start 
uh, we well, we wouldn't start uh, making inquiries and um, searching for information on people who well we didn't have any evidence or any in indications. No, I, I can. I, I've, I've fair enough. I understand. I just wondered how we, we deal with these in isolation because very often. It, it's more than just one person, that's all. Because it, 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 how they get involved. So it's only not from a case I've heard about. Not to worry. Thank um, you for the response. Thank you, Councillor Wade. Sorry, sir. If I could offer some reassurance, um, the children or the young people that, or, or the people that tend to be in Channel Panel um, tend to be uh, just just one person with no evidence that any of the, any anyone else has has been involved. Thank you. Okay. We don't have any more questions. So, Sarah, thank you again. Um, we'll move on now to item six Willow activity for April 2020 to February 2021. Stuart? Yes, thank you, Chairman uh, and members. This, I, I think, this is a really important report, and it might be something that this whole subject area might be something that, that the advisory panel will want to see further information in due course. Um, just in terms of setting the scene, the Willow team is a specialist uh, anti-exploitation team. Um, it, and I don't wish to be um, alarmist in any way, but if I, I deal with child protection and risk to children every single day, I believe the exploitation of children in Hampshire is the single biggest risk to them, whether that's organised exploitation through county lines, which is organised drug running, whether that's local drug running, or whether it's through uh, online exploitation, much as we've talked about around prevent, but also around uh, predatory online abuse. That, that Hampshire is no different to any other local authority in that sense. As I said, I don't want to be alarmist. That's the reality of the world that children live in today, I'm afraid. Uh, and the Willow team is our specialist service that is uh, at the forefront of working with the police and tackling these issues. But it is a central issue that all of my services are working with, as, as are the police. The exploitation of children has been around for many years. It's just very different nowadays and it's very well organised on some occasions. And so that's why you need specialist services to disrupt that activity. And this isn't a, a, an issue just in Basingstoke or just in Haven. This is an issue across the whole of Hampshire. Um, children are targeted and um, a small number of them are exploited which is why we have to work as we do with teams like the Willow to prevent that and, and uh, to uh, disrupt that activity. So again, I'll be quiet and hand over to Sarah because Sarah's part of Sarah's sort of safeguarding lead covers the Willow team as well. Okay, okay back to you, Sarah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so this is quite a long report. Um, so I will just draw out uh, some of the headlines and some of, some of the headlines that I uh, think are important. So just to give a bit of context, um, the Willow team was set up in 2015 and um, in 2020, uh, uh, 2021, it, it's firmly embedded in um, as part of our structure and uh, as part of our practice. When the team was set up, it was set up to, uh, to respond to child sexual exploitation um, and, and the team focused purely on child sex, sexual exploitation and it was set up in, in the aftermath of um, Rotherham and uh, Oxfordshire, those, those big um, child, child abuse in, investigations. Um, in terms of how the Willow team is made up, it is made up of three social workers and an unqualified family support worker, an assistant team manager and a team and a team manager. It also has two or provision for two nurses to be part of that team. Um, and over the last year, we have struggled with securing health input. Um, we had the funding for, for the health input, but we were unable to uh, recruit those positions. We think that we've now solved this issue and we have a CAMS uh, nurse working alongside us and we're about to go out to um, interview uh, for, for a second worker. Um, 
In addition to that core team, we have um, been able to utilise some violence reduction money um, in order to uh, fund for the, for the last year, we have funded two youth crime prevention officers to specifically target our pupil referral units. So our pupil referral units are small units uh, where children go um, when there's, there's been some element of uh, behavioural difficulties within school. Um, our pupil referral units will often have our most vulnerable children in them in terms of exploitation. And for, for the last year, we, we've been able to use this violence reduction money um, to divert to, um, youth crime prevention officers to those units in order to do some preventative work. Um, the other thing that we have used our violence reduction money for is some um, workers from a charity called St Giles and those workers have been used to do some work with young people where um, where gang issues are, are a problem and they're, they're gang exit workers um, and they have the expertise that perhaps some of the workers in, in Hampshire and some of the workers in the Willow team uh, don't necessarily have. Um, so, so they're gang exit workers and, and they've been seconded to the Willow team by the use of this violence reduction money. Um, in addition to, to that, to those workers, the Police and Crime Commissioner has funded a half-time uh, substance misuse worker um, so we have a worker from an organisation called Catch22 um, who, is, who is also seconded to the team. Um, and and we, we just started to, to kind of make use of that worker. That, that work is now, now uh, in post. Um, in terms of the work that the Willow team do, um, they will take cases from the multi-agency safeguarding hub and they will take Section 47 cases, so that's child protection cases, we, they will take the highest risk cases uh, and they will undertake the child protection investigation and they'll work closely with the police around that, that um, investigation. In addition to, to those uh, child protection cases that they take and, and investigate, they will take cases where they from, from other areas of the service, so they may take a case from a haven't social worker, uh, where the Willow team will undertake direct work. Um, the Willow team social worker won't assume case responsibility because uh, we don't want that worker, that Willow team worker, to have to kind of get bogged down in the child protection visits or the child in need visits. We want them to specifically work and have the time to work on exploitation issues. Um, so for that reason, we deliberately keep the caseloads in, in the Willow team down uh, uh, to, to, to being quite small. Um, so if, if you look at the numbers in, in the report, the, the number of cases uh, that the Willow are working with at any one time or um, remain quite, quite small in comparison to, to other districts. And the reason for that is the children that we're, we're taking referrals on, either from the multi-agency safeguarding hub or nominations on from um, other district social workers or the youth offending team, those children are typically the most hard to reach children. So they will require a more intensive service from, from, from a social worker. And that's where the Willow team uh, step in and, and come into, into their own. Um, other important uh, pieces of work that the Willow team undertake is we provide consultancy um, for other children's services teams. Um, we will attend all high risk strategy meetings where possible and over the last year we uh, attended 90 high risk strategy meetings. So a high risk strategy meeting 
um, is where a young person is constantly or frequently going missing uh, from home, where they're starting to become involved in gang issues or county lines issues uh, or, or criminal exploitation. So the Willow team will um, attend to offer some, some expertise. Um, in terms of uh, other pieces of work, we played a really big role in training for professionals. Um, and over, over the last year, we've managed to train over a thousand professionals. And some of those professionals include uh, our residential staff. Uh, so there's staff that work in our children's homes. Uh, we've undertaken training for magistrates. We've, we've done webinars, multi-agency webinars. Uh, we've un undertaken training for education settings and foster carers. Uh, and we've also presented to the uh, vol voluntary organisations because we believe that we need to kind of increase people's awareness of exploitation um, and uh, get people to be alert to, to the signs of ex exploitation and grooming. Uh, one of the tools that we use as a county is a risk assessment called tool, and that, that's called a Seraph tool, and that's a child exploitation and risk assessment form. Um, and that form was originally uh, introduced by Bernardo several years ago and specifically focused on child sex, sexual exploitation. Um, in Hampshire, we, because we have moved away from just working with child sex, sexual exploitation, and we now consider child criminal exploitation, we now consider county lines, which is uh, drug, drug dealing and, and, and drug behaviour. We also consider modern slavery. We felt that the risk assessment tool, the Seraph tool, um, was a bit out of date. So we have worked with the other four local authorities um, in order to update that risk assessment tool so that it will help social workers identify when young people are, are becoming involved in, in other types of organisations, uh, sorry, other types of exploitation. Uh, we were also an early adopter site in Hampshire for the independent child trafficking guardians. Um, and we, we remained on the steering group and we have, have uh, re retained close links with those trafficking guardians. Um, what we found in, in Hampshire is those, those trafficking guardians tend to work work with any child who has has been trafficked, uh, whether that's an unaccompanied asylum seeker or whether that's a, a young person that may have been trafficked from, uh, I don't know, from, from Eastleigh to Basingstoke for the purposes of, of, of exploitation. Well, because we have a Willow team, what we found is that those, tra those independent child trafficking gu guardians don't offer a great deal in terms of uh, the internal trafficking. So we have tended in Hampshire to use those trafficking guardians for our unaccompanied asylum seeking children um, because the, the Willow team are already in there and, and doing that work with, with young people that are, have been exploited. Um, so in order to get on top of the exploitation problem, information sharing and up-to-date risk assessment is, is really key. And each district has what we call an operational MET group, which is an operation operational missing exploited traffic group. And uh, each district will meet to discuss all of the children who live in that area uh, and discuss the risks around them. And that, that's a multi-agency meeting. Uh, so it will have neighbourhood policing team there. It will have um, officers from the missing and exploited traffic police team. Um, it's usually chaired by one of our district managers in, in each area. And um, the Willow team will again attend all of those uh, 
operational MET meetings uh, in, or, in order to provide insight, um, in order to provide advice, but it also means that having the Willow team member at those um, each of those operational MET meetings, it means that we can link up and um, exploitation is rarely stopped at the, at, at the border of um, uh, of a district. So, um, so the young people that are active in Basingstoke are probably also active uh, down in Hart and Rushmore and the, the kind of net widens and it's by having Willow team at each of those meetings we can start to piece the pictures together and uh, share information um, across the county. Uh, so, in addition to that, we are also supportive of our police colleagues and we reg regularly work closely with them on uh, their various operations. Uh, so, the police are, uh, they have a whole unit called Monument, which looks at county lines. We're really closely linked in to, uh, to, to the police on that. They're also uh, running a pilot around uh, children who frequently go missing uh, called Operation Salvus, where we, we linked in and we're sharing information um, in, in order to try and reduce the risk around uh, young people who, who, who often, often go missing. Um, we are looking, uh, once, uh, once we get some normality back to, to the working environment, we're very open to, to look into locating police colleagues uh, alongside the, the Willow team, if that, that's at all possible. Uh, one of the other big areas of work that we've undertaken is um, we've worked with police to increase the amount of police, uh, amount of intelligence that, that is shared. So the police have a system where they uh, collect intelligence on what's called a CPI form uh, and that's a community partnership intelligence form and uh, we have worked quite hard with police uh, over the last 12 months to increase the, the use of the CPI form uh, among um, social workers, among schools and uh, health professionals. Um, I think I said in the last presentation that um, all unaccompanied asylum seekers coming into the country have a trafficking assessment and an age assessment and Willow team are present at all of those uh, assessments so that we can, because they're, they're the experts when, when it comes to considering um, trafficking. Uh, one of the other teams that we manage, uh, we have a Frankie team uh, which sits under the Willow team, and that's a joint funded team between the Police and Crime Commissioner and Health and Children's Services um, input in, into that team is that we actually provide the management support, so we provide the supervision, we manage the referrals and we, um, uh, um, we provide the physical space for, for that team and that's how, that makes up our financial contribution. Uh, so the Frankie team is a counselling service for young people who have experienced child sexual exploitation or child sexual abuse. Um, each young person um, that is referred to that team is entitled to, to between six and 12 sessions. Um, and for the first time uh, over, um, over the last two years, we, we've actually got a waiting list um, for, for that service. Um, in, in terms of uh, our performance around missing, uh, the Willow team have undertaken quite a lot of work in, uh, with other colleagues in children's services around revamping our process. Um, uh, when, when children go missing. Um, so each young person, when they go missing from home or when they go missing from care, we need to undertake a return conversation with, with them. 
Uh, and the reason that we undertake that return conversation is to ensure, to give them an opportunity to talk about their experiences while, while they were missing. And those return conversations are really key and really crucial to, um, to us gathering information and to start to spot the signs of exploitation. Um, and we felt in children's services that we needed to do more work around the quality and the frequency of those, those conversations. So Willow have been key in redeveloping uh, that process and supporting our district social workers um, to, in, to, to make sure that those conversations happen in um, a, a timely fashion. Um, the Willow have also been involved in uh, quite a few projects, so we, we've still got the gang exit workers. Uh, we are leading a project uh, across the four local authorities um, where we're producing a number of uh, films, a, a series of five films that will go out across social media, across um, uh, and also go out to schools with a resource pack. Uh, which looks at exploitation and looks at grooming. The, the uh, films are aimed at young people and parents. Um, in addition, we've managed to secure um, 10 sessions of work uh, for parents um, by a group called PACE, which is uh, Parents Against Child Exploitation. Um, Obviously, some of our work has been impacted by COVID um, in that um, when we've been locked down, um, it's often, it, it has been difficult to see some of those hard to reach uh, young people. Um, and in order to work with those young people, the, the worker needs to have a, a degree of persistence because they're, they're, there's quite often the young people are not always willing to meet meet with us and COVID in some respects has have hampered that 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 relationship. We have continued to work face to face, but there, there, there has been a small impact on our ability to, to meet with some, some difficult um, children or children who are difficult, difficult to reach. Um, so overall, the Willow team um, it's a well-respected team across our partners and it's, it, it's well established and well respected uh, within children's services and it's constantly uh, trying to stay ahead of the exploitation game and, and kind of get on, on, on the same curve and, and kind of the nature of exploitation has changed quite considerably over, over the last few years and um, it, essentially kind of the, the Willow team are, are kind of at the forefront um, and, and supportive of colleagues uh, to, to, to work on exploitation. I think I'll stop now and let you uh, come back to me with some questions. Thank you, Sarah, very much indeed. Uh, we've got Councillor Wade. Thank you, Chairman. Yeah, thank you again, Sarah. There's two really sensitive reports you've delivered to us today and it just really really well um i have i've i've seen you or listened to one of your, your presentations before and i know what great work the willow team does in a really challenging environment i've got a question what do you think is the biggest challenge now is it the fact that the funding isn't consistent to get the resources you need to going forward because it, it's, it's it's dependent on, on the outside factors or is it an increase in, in, in particularly in the criminal exploitation of young people that, that seems to be prevalent across the country, not just in not just anywhere in Hampshire. Um, I, I think it, I, if I'm honest, I think I have to say it's a bit of both. So the I, I'm relatively I'm I'm really confident that the three social workers and the team manager and the assistant team manager are permanent features of the Willow team and will be a, a, a permanent strategy o, over the years uh, um, as a, a permanent part of children's services in in kind of working with that. Um, 
I, I think in terms of other specialist resources, so the gang reduction workers are funded by violence reduction, the violence yeah. reduction unit and um, the uh, PRU workers were also funded by the violence reduction unit. This year we didn't have as much violence reduction money so we had a choice to make. Do we do we go with the PRU workers or do we go with the um, gang exit workers? Um, and we, we had to choose to go with gang exit workers because uh, we really needed some of that work uh, to be taking place, uh, uh, yeah, particularly around uh, some of our areas in, in the north of the county. Um, the substance misuse worker is going to be a really good addition, given that the majority of our child criminal exploitation is around drug running and uh, uh but again, that, that's a half-funded post that, that's come from the Police and Crime Commissioner. Um, so I, I, I think the Willow team, I think it would be very easy to sit here and say uh, the biggest challenge is be the team not being permanent and as being dependent on um, grant money. But the nature of exploitation changes and we also, I think the Willow team are very good at adapting to, to what we do. So we started with, with child sexual exploitation. The majority of our work now is child criminal exploitation. Um, and we're good at going to the violence reduction unit and asking for money. We're good at saying, actually, we've got a need here for a drugs worker. Um, and it, it, as exploitation changes, the, the team will have to change to to meet that need or to meet that demand. OK, thank you for the answer. Good thank answer. you. Thank you. Councillor Briggs. Thank you, Chairman. And thank you again, Sarah. Your work is so vital and I think you must be very stretched at times. And my question really follows on from Councillor Wade um, because on um, page 11, it's page 101, um, report 33, um, it says the HIP strategic plan does outline the need to reach more medium and emerging risk children and focus on them before the exploitation becomes entranced behaviour. Willow is unable currently to do both, so has had to work with the highest risk cases predominantly. Is that through lack of skilled workers or through lack of money? Because surely it's better to, the choice for you must be awful, but it must be better to stop, to stop them before they get to the high risk. Um, perhaps I'll, I'll come in on that point. I, I, and Sarah did um, touch on it in, in, when she was going yeah. through before. We deliberately kept Willow as a specialist team but preventing child sexual and child criminal exploitation is everybody's business. It's not children's services business. It's everybody's communities have a role to play in that. So we, whilst it's not, I don't perceive it to be Willow's responsibility to uh, identify all of the children at medium and low risk. I think that's for other services. Yes, for children's services. Yes, for schools. Yes, for the police. Yes, for health services. That's everybody's responsibility. So we deliberately kept Willow at the high end um, and it's not there, they don't have the resource or the remit. Uh, everybody has to be educated about what exploitation indicators look like and how they can then refer on to get support for children at the earliest time. I mean, you're right to raise it because we absolutely want to prevent cases escalating and children risk to children becoming uh, more significant. But that's what our early help service is for. That's that whole early help approach is around intervening at an earlier stage. Okay, thank you, Stuart. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Henderson. Thank you, Chair. Um, Sarah, thank you so much for your report. That, that was so helpful. Um, you mentioned the, that you work closely with the police, and I, I was wondering if you also work directly with the British Transport Police, because I know that they've been very successful in looking how young children are being used to transport drugs on the train networks, especially in Basingstoke. Um, so I, I was just wondering if, you, if you're linking directly with, with the British Transport Police as well. 
So the Willow team will link in with uh, British Transport Police uh, where necessary. Um, our biggest relationship is with the high harm teams and with the uh, police missing and exploited traffic team uh, and also the neighbourhood teams. And we talk about Basin State, there's a whole uh, plan and approach around the difficulties in Basingstoke and um, we meet to uh, a wrap, we meet to discuss the issues in Basingstoke as a multi-agency meeting every couple of weeks and um, the transport police are, are, are involved and also uh, in terms of uh, the hips wide approach the Hampshire Isle of Wight Portsmouth Southampton approach. Um, we meet quarterly with exploitation uh, colleagues across uh, the four local authorities um, and that, that's that's a meeting that's chaired with the police and we will contribute to, to that meeting and share information and the British Transport Police have been linked closely closely in with, um, with that meeting. Uh, we tend to rely on our police colleagues to, to do that very, very close liaison uh, with, with the transport police and, and kind of they're, they're in, in, in good contact and close contact and, and we, we, we benefit from um, their, their intelligence or the intelligence that they bring to the, to the table and to the picture. Thank you very much. Thank you. We do not have any more hands up. Sarah, thank you so much. Very helpful and informative. In fact, I'd like to thank all the officers that presented their reports today. It's been a great help to all of us. Thank you. Well, we're coming to the end now of our, um, I think, haven't we, our minutes. So uh, nothing else to say. Only thank you all for coming. Uh, uh, Rhys, are you there? I am Councillor. Would you like okay, me to end the good. broadcast? Hi. Um, do we have um, another date for another meeting or is that to come? Uh, if you're talking about the next cycle, Councillor, I can certainly look back through that date does exist. Yeah, and send it out to everybody. That would be great. I don't think I need to add any more, do I? Uh, we've all done uh, lots of questions been asked. Uh, just for clarification, Councillor, the okay. next date is the 12th of October as it stands. Okay. So we'll get we'll get a calendar invite out for that, won't we? Indeed. Yeah, wonderful. Well, thank you all for attending. Um, I think I like, found that all very informative. Uh, quite opened my mind up quite a lot, actually. So thank you all for coming, and uh, see you again at some point. Thank all you. Right.